Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Brooks Roach. I'm Diabetes Education Specialist with Diabetes Canada. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you all here today and start by acknowledging that I am joining this webinar from the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people on Prince Edward Island. And wherever you're joining or watching from, I invite you to express gratitude and recognize the land on which we live uh, and the, the past inhabitants of these Indigenous lands we now call Canada. So I am here joined by a couple of wonderful guests today to talk about something that may feel a little bit unfamiliar after the past roughly 18 months, and that is travel. So it's likely been a while for you, and we wanted to take this chance to offer a reminder or introduction to the best strategies for managing diabetes while on the road, in the air, and all places in between. So we're joined today by Chris Jarvis, who is an Olympic rower and founder of I Challenge Diabetes. Chris lives with type 1 diabetes. Uh, welcome, Chris, and Amanda Gill, who uh, also lives with type 1 diabetes and is a destination expert with Kensington Tours uh, and has trekked to nearly 60 countries. So welcome and thank, thank you to you both. Uh, really excited to hear what you have to say on this topic. Uh, we'll be covering some key topics around travel and we'll also be taking questions from you, our viewers. So if at any point through the, the webinar you have a question or a comment, feel free to post it in the Facebook comments and we will pose it to our guests. Um, some questions have already been submitted and uh, feel free to, to keep engaged. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Amanda. Um, and the question I want to pose to you, Amanda, is what are the key differences that people with diabetes will notice when they're traveling now compared to before COVID-19. Hi, thanks, Brett Brooks. Um, so, I mean, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that travel can be stressful at the best of times, um, but certainly with added measures for COVID, um, it can be more stressful. Um, so be mindful of that, that you, you know, may end up with you know, extra stress spikes to your blood sugar for no apparent reason. Um, but one of my biggest pieces of advice is to be prepared. There's going to be longer lines uh, potentially, uh, there, and um, you know, th things like less service on flights. So be prepared with, you know, extra low supplies and snacks. Um, I've experienced in Pearson Airport, the water fountains have been blocked off. Um, so I normally bring an empty reusable bottle to then fill up when I go through. That's not a, as easy to do anymore. Um, you're going to need to be wearing a mask throughout your flight, uh, with the exception of eating and drinking. Um, wearing a mask is always a challenge. We're all used to it now. Um, but one thing I've done on flights is I actually bring a straw. That way, when I am thirsty, I don't need to remove my mask. And I can just slide the straw under my mask to have it have a drink. Um, as well on shorter flights, um, you know, instead of having a meal on the plane and having to remove my mask for that, uh, I might eat beforehand. And um, on a longer flight, if you're going internationally, um, you might get hungry in eight or ten hours. So, so just uh, you know, kind of understanding and being comfortable with taking off your mask for those meals and before putting it um, before putting it back on. Um, I have found on domestic flights that there is less service um, being offered, um, smaller meal selections. Uh, so again, maybe you're bringing your own snacks, uh, which you may already be doing, but uh, just be prepared that uh, you may not have you know, you may only be able to have that tin of Pringles by the time they get to your, your seat. Uh, trust me, that happened to me this summer, that that was all they had when, when the, the meal cart reached my aisle. Uh, so those are, um, you know, a, a few little tips for the flights. Um, and then as well, if you're traveling internationally, you may have uh, requirements for taking PCR tests beforehand, showing those results, showing vaccination certificates. So again, being prepared for those longer lines, uh, making sure you've got your low supplies with you um, because you may not be able to run to a kiosk to buy, to buy a juice um, if something happens. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. I uh, personally, I haven't been on a plane since early, early 2020. So um, the, the resounding tip that I keep hearing is making sure that you have, for example, any 
proof of vaccination, any you know, vaccine passport, any um, basically just stocking up on whatever new forms of paperwork that have appeared in the last couple of years, as well as taking a bit of extra time to stock up on, on low supplies is that's a pro tip. Um, so the next question is going to be go to Chris, and this is sort of looking at travel a bit more in general outside of the scope of what has the pandemic done. And that question would be, if I have travel on the horizon, if I'm planning a trip, what are the key steps that I should take in the planning phase? Thanks, Brooks. And uh, definitely when I was younger, um, I didn't do much travel with my family. We were very like locally based. And so it was actually my, my sport that drew me out of it. And I think that's a wonderful thing for all of you that are watching this uh, webinar today. You've already uh, realized that you could learn from your teammates and Diabetes Canada is putting on this uh, webinar here to help share some insights. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, I think I was so accelerated in my learning because of my teammates around me. Um, now, one of the things that they didn't have is all of my rowing teammates, which was the, the main thing that I was doing on the uh, national rowing team, as they didn't have diabetes. And so there were some of those things that I had to learn the hard way. Um, so, you know, we first off think about our supplies that we might need uh, for day to day. And then if you think about the things you might want to do on that travel horizon, that's going to help you to start to zoom in on that so you can be prepared for it. So we have uh, learned that there's lots of other um, types of gear that comes along with those sports or activities that you might want to do. Um, so a dry bag, for example, is something that you can roll up and keep your supplies safe from water. And if you could believe it, I went rowing for um, 18 practices a week until I got to the Olympic level and I'd never heard of or seen a dry bag. And then I went on a white water rafting trip and other people had dry bags for their electronics. And I didn't have that for my diabetes gear. So that was something that I really encourage you to do is not only to think about what you need, but think about what other people are doing in that environment and how could you adapt that to be your diabetes uh, support. Um, and a big thing for me has been traveling uh, is the diet in that local area. And that could be some brand new foods that you might be expecting. Uh, for me living with celiac, it kind of puts a little extra pressure on it, but to start calculating and thinking, okay, so there's a, a rice-based diet, how I'm gonna have to get really good with that. Um, and get a little bit prepared so it's not uh, bringing any extra anxiety um, and you can deal with it in advance. Um, I remember even just in being in the south of uh, the United States, some of the portion sizes down there were monstrous and I was pretty excited about it to be honest, but it definitely meant that I needed to be calculating a different amount of insulin and a different amount of activity to balance that all out um, or bring some to-go containers if uh, nothing else. Uh, lastly, I would just encourage you to think about the language that you need to be uh, thinking about. And if you're going for an extended trip or a trip to a remote place somewhere that you wouldn't be able to access the type of uh, medical supplies that you're bringing, you might want to think about the, the language that you're going to need to have and have a little note card or an app that you can help with in case you were to lose your insulin, um, you know, heaven forbid. But we have heard that over and over again, that it's one of the biggest challenges that someone has their diabetes supplies um, put aside and then they lose it somewhere. Um, so being able to know where you would find that, what kind of support could you get in that country and what kind of language are they speaking there? Those are good things. And that's what I learned from my teammates. They would, uh, you know, jot down a lot of the popular expressions that they wanted to use when we were going to somewhere, uh, say Italy, um, to, to be able to converse and support yourself as you go touring around. Thank you, Chris. Um, I, I think there's an interesting uh, point in there about these longer haul treks, which Amanda, you had mentioned that earlier about some of these, you know, if you're preparing for an eight to 10 hour flight or, or longer, um, the difference in preparation that you have to inject into that. So I'm, I'm wondering, Amanda, if you could share any advice for adjusting insulin specifically when someone is traveling across multiple, multiple time zones. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, obviously, my first recommendation is talk to your medical team um, because they may have different advice, um, but I've certainly over many years of traveling with diabetes have honed things and differently than I did when I was on multiple daily injections. Um, I'm now, I've been on an insulin pump for over 10 years and, and so the, my methods have changed. Um, with my pump, I am using an older model um, Medtronic pump, and um, I tend to adjust the time on my pump 
as I'm in flight. So for example, if I'm flying from Toronto to Vancouver, um, it's a three hour time difference. Flight is about four and a half hours, but let's say six hours, you know, from arriving at the airport till leaving the next. So I'll adjust the time on my pump every two hours by one hour. And so on, you know, flying to um, Nepal or something, you know, I've got a bigger time difference, a longer journey. So I kind of balance out how long I'm in transit. And that does seem to work for me. Um, but one thing I do find is very often in flight, you might uh, run a little bit higher. Um, just due to inactivity, um, certainly, um, I know I eat more when I'm in an aircraft um, than I do normally because they often just keep bringing more snacks and meals. Uh, so I'll often increase the basal um, level of insulin I'm, I'm getting, you know, whether it's 10, 15% to try and keep myself in range. And, um, but then Towards the end of my flight, um, I do find as, as I land, my blood sugar may start dropping, especially when, as we've all experienced at many airports around the world, you could be walking 20 minutes just to get to customs or to the baggage carousel. Uh, so I'm always prepared that I may have that, that low on arrival. And, you know, again, going back to talking before about being prepared with your low treatments. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've munched on glucose tablets as I'm waiting to uh, speak with the customs agent. Uh, so those are some of um, some of the tips that I um, personally take when I take with me when I'm traveling. But I know Chris, you so you use some different methods. Um, do you have uh, any different suggestions? Well, I think um, what's a little bit relieving here is that we have a little bit more stability in both the long acting insulins that some of you might be using as well as with insulin pumps that are automated at this point. Um, and so there's a couple of different brands now and I use one of them that will actually adjust my background insulin or my basal insulin um, as, as is needed. And so that's kind of relieved a lot of the, the tension around when do you actually change your time zone and how much of that time zone will play a factor because all of your activity, as Amanda was saying, when you get off the flight, I've definitely had that, uh, you know, off the flight low uh, happen too many times. Um, so that's part of my plan as well. And I love the uh, the recommendation to talk to your your team and come up with a plan to share with them. And I think that's really helpful. But uh, yeah, the automation of, of pumps and the stability of the long acting insulin is really helping us uh, to have confidence when we're traveling. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I can speak myself. I remember a pretty catastrophic low landing in Brisbane after a you know 14 hour flight Vancouver to Brisbane, Australia. And uh, that's that prime example of a lot of inactivity. Then even a slight change of just wandering around the airport, the mad scramble to get luggage that led to a pretty significant crash. So it's definitely a recurring theme. Um, I, I'm thinking on that note of uh, actually managing medications and technologies. Uh, I'm wondering, Chris, if you could share some best practices on actually going through security and screening and managing a person's medications and technologies in that setting. Thanks. And um, I think that the uh, idea of managing is, is the most important thing. This is one of the areas that can cause the most stress, I think, for people when you're going through security and screenings. Um, I've even had, you know, go, going through security, but then just as you're getting on the plane, another surprise security uh, screening there. Um, so on that note, I think it's most important for us all to try and find that inner calm, because there are times where you're going to run into the wrong person who might be, maybe we could use the word ignorant, uh, more aggressive or hostile. And as long as we maintain our cool and you explain that this is medical equipment, um, that person will have to go and check in with someone else. And you'll find somebody who's much easier to talk to about that. So I've had that happen before where I got a little hot tempered. And Brooks, I think that's the biggest learning that I had along the way is that my response to that didn't help at all. Um, so I've been through the check stops at, at airports hundreds of times. And I find that every time that I bring it, and if it's nicely organized, then it's even easier. So, you know, finding an organizational system where you know where your supplies are and uh, what you brought with you. Um, and I've 
actually discovered this by accident that when you re reveal like that you have a medical condition, it can actually help. So I had a juice box, which I wasn't intending to fly because at that time, you know, flying with liquids was definitely not approved. Uh, and so um, I mentioned, oh, shoot, you know, that, that was for my low blood sugar. And the person said, oh, do you have diabetes? And that was just a really nice uh, agent there that was doing the check. And they said, oh, well, you're allowed to have something to treat your low blood sugar. And I'd never known that that was actually um, permitted. So I was always using Dex tabs or some type of solid uh, low treatment. So I try to pass that on as well, is that we are allowed to have a reasonable amount of, of low supplies in, in most circumstances, but I would always bring, um, you know, something that's, that's hard uh, as a backup as well there. But I think the attitude is the biggest thing that helps us to get through that and then knowing where our supplies are. From, uh, you know, a fear perspective, I've had people that um, would put their bags in checked luggage and goes under the plane. And I think that's one thing that we want to watch out specifically with our medications, because the plane uh, temperature where the luggage is, is not regulated. So that, uh, that could cause some freezing of insulin or other medications that we wouldn't want to see, but it is nice to have backup supplies there. So if you're going on a long trip, for example, you might want to have some backup, you know, uh, needles or pump supplies, anything like that. Um, but your actual liquid insulin supply should be with you on your carry-on. Um, and I also say that, you know, when you put it up above your head in the, in the stowaway, you also want to make sure you have something right there with you at the seat, because it could be, you know, a time where you're not allowed to get up, there's turbulence, and that might be a time where it's really ideal to do maybe an injection of insulin, or um, maybe a pump site has fallen off, or you have a low blood sugar. So I always have a smaller uh, component, component that can pull out and come right into the seat with me. And a lot of people say, you know, oh, Chris, you're six foot four. How do you fit into one of those airplane seats? Um, you figure it out, right? You just find your way to be comfortable. And the same thing with a long travel um, in a car, right? You want to have the same supplies with you accessible and you never want to say, oh, you know, I'll be fine. Why not have those supplies ready? And so I do the same thing. I've driven across Canada back and forth. I've driven down to Florida, uh, driving a 14 person passenger van with one of our charitable initiatives. Um, and so always being ready. If you don't have a sensor, um, you know, making sure that you're testing uh, frequently and managing that so that it's always accessible when you need it. That's what I would say. Thanks, Chris. I, I think it, that's a su super helpful, um, the, the idea of what, what person's attitude or mindset dictating so much of the outcome is super, super relevant. And I think Oftentimes planning a trip, there's, it becomes so overwhelming because there are so many factors seemingly beyond our control that if you can kind of zoom back in and say, well, there are, that's going to be the case. But if so long as I am aware of what I need, what I have on me, uh, I'm going to that will set me up as well as I possibly can. Um, and that's the same sort of approach being applied to having you know, the right supplies with you, even even in the right space within the plane. Uh, it's, you're planning as much as you possibly can, recognizing there is potential for, you know, plans to, to go awry, but you're, you're building sort of an antibody to that. And I would say as well, um, I'm, I didn't mention about like, if you are someone who wears an insulin pump, uh, going through the, the sensor, uh, going through this, you know, the new scanning device that scans your body for metal. Um, the ones that actually move and have the magnetic uh, rotation, um, you don't have to go through that. You can ask for someone to do a pat down. Um, and you can also wear your insulin pump through the, the, the one that beeps when you, when you walk through it. Um, and that one, uh, you can let them know that you're wearing an insulin pump. I find that, um, you know, it's, it's really, again, it's the person that you're dealing with. If you walk through and you keep it hidden and discreet, um, sometimes the pump does not go off. It's kind of like a cumulative effect of metal. Um, so when you walk through there, uh, if you do have a beep, like let them know what you're, what you're holding and why. Um, and most people respond really well. And again, on that note of your attitude, it kind of dictates the way well, you can't escalate the, 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 the fire here. If you're staying calm and, and telling them that you have diabetes, this is an approved device. And, uh, and you'd like to speak to somebody who understands, right? So, yeah, totally. I think we might have a bit of a, a cat trying to get in on the action, but I've, I've my, had the yeah, my cat is being aggressive, just like some uh, of the agents that I've dealt okay. with in security. <laughs> um, so I, I really appreciate the the 
wealth of travel experience that you're both bringing into this uh, in, in very different capacities, headed to very different destinations. And I just wanted to kind of open the door. If you, if either of you had anything else, any other points or tips that you wanted to share um, to feel free. Well, I think, um, you know, Chris was talking previously about, you know, not putting insulin um, in the undercarriage of the aircraft. And on a similar note, I do find, especially on longer trips, it's good to sort of separate your supplies but between a, f a few of your bags, um, because you never know when you might leave that backpack sitting on a bench somewhere or you know, the, um, trust me, I once had a trunk get locked and we couldn't get our baggage out of it. They had to take apart the car. Um, and so, you know, it was good that I also had pump supplies in my backpack in the car with me while we waited several hours so I could get the rest of my supplies relieved. So that certainly um, never keep everything in one place because whether you leave it behind or heaven forbid something gets stolen, um, you'll have a backup. And I think, Amanda, the, uh, the one saying that someone said to me when I was much younger is a place for everything and everything in its place. And for those of you that, that hate organizing things, I'm not the type of person that likes to take that time and uh, have, have had struggles for that reason. But the more that I commit to that, especially while traveling and thinking about the motivation of it, right? I am so excited to be traveling. I'm really uh, you know, hopeful to have a good experience here. If you can use that to motivate you to put things back where you expect them to be, and then that way, um, every time you need that blood test kit or, or the, the piece, then it's not an added stress. And diabetes, you know, can pop up on us in the worst of moments. Um, in fact, when I was traveling, this is pr prior to COVID, but I was traveling with my two daughters for the first time. Um, Juliet was still a little baby in the car seat. And then Stella was just old enough to walk. And I had a low while I was trying to carry the car seat and holding Stella's hand, walking through, trying to meet up with my wife. Um, and it was, it was definitely something that, that caught me off guard and had me a little stressed. But you have a plan. And so you go back to your supplies, you know, you, you grab onto those. Um, and then we can get through a lot of these challenging moments with a little bit of impact into our big trip travel. And that's what I like to look at is if I have to pause for 15 minutes to fix this, it's within my plan. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be able to deal with it. And, and that helps me to stay calm headed, not make any further mistakes. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's what I would hope for is to be able to remember where I put my, my supplies. It doesn't always happen, to be honest, but I do try. Thanks, folks. Um, so we're, we're going to open the floor to questions. We do have a, a, quite a number of questions coming in on, on Facebook. So want to make sure we have, have adequate time to to meaningfully and, and properly answer everyone. Um, the first one is regarding hydration on flights. So uh, it, the question says, water on flights, uh, guessing that they do not give much with less staff based on what you said earlier. Um, so recommendations for getting enough water to stay hydrated, hydrated. I'm assuming this is especially with, with longer haul flights. Yeah, and uh, so as far as that goes, because I was mentioning, for example, Toronto Airport, at least the last time I was there in August, I couldn't use their water fountains. However, I have found at some of the restaurants near the gate, they're very happy to fill up my reusable bottles, or of course, you can, you can purchase at the kiosks. Um, but I always will have at least 750 ml of water that I fill up and bring on board with me. When they come around offering drinks, I'll usually ask for a couple just to, to, to stay hydrated. And, and generally, I'm always leaving still with water in, in my bottle. Yeah, and that's a good point because I've definitely been the person that brings around my reusable and being caught unaware, uh, seeing that the fountains have been closed off. I hadn't thought about that as an option. Um, and certainly going onto a, a plane with an empty water bottle isn't very helpful. So that's a great question. Thanks, Amanda. The, the next question we have is, is a little bit to do, or a little bit related to, for example, Chris, your point around being able to have a juice box on hand. And that this question is, uh, I've been told that we can take an extra piece of hand luggage carrying all of our diabetes supplies on board. Is this true? 
do, do either of you know know more about this? Well, I, I don't know the actual regulations on it, um, but I do know that um, that I often bring a, a small uh, component with me, as, as I mentioned, um, and I try to keep it within the size. I think the size is really where you're going to get into trouble. So if you're packing huge bags and an extra one, that's when they're going to be, be a bit more critical. Um, but, but Amanda, I'm not sure if you have more understanding of the actual regulations there. Yeah, and and it is my understanding that you can. I believe you do need to get um, medical, like you know, sort of get approval from the airline beforehand. It's not something I've ever done because being allowed, you know, a carry on as well as a personal item like a purse or a small backpack for, um, you know, generally I can fit everything I I need even when I've gone on month long trips in those. Um, but it's certainly if you are concerned about, you know, being able to bring a little bit more on board, um, contact the airline before travel, um, because I'm, I'm, I, I do believe it is permitted if you get the approval. Yeah, thanks, folks. And, and we do have, uh, Diabetes Canada does have a web page on air travel, uh, and I can look into updating that if there are any specific um, you know, extra extra tidbits, especially post COVID on that front. So uh, you can check out diabetes.ca slash air travel, and it will, it'll have some extra info after the fact. Um, we have a question that says, has anyone had any experience with getting quote unquote stuck in a foreign country for an extended amount of time and not having enough supplies available? What did you do? Uh, and, and a second part to that question is anyone experiencing issues charging their insulin pump in a foreign country due to a different type of outlet. Good. Um, so I have a few experiences being stuck or, you know, having a, an insulin challenge. And so uh, my first time actually traveling, I went to Italy and on the way back, because I didn't speak any Italian, there were signs in the airport suggesting that there was a, a closing of the airport at this date. And that was, the day after I was traveling or the day before I was traveling back. So when I went to that airport, it was closed. And uh, so I had to tr try and figure out, call the uh, airline company and they'd move my flight to another city all altogether. Um, so I ended up spending a couple of extra days trying to get back home. Um, luckily I had the supplies in that case. And I think the question is more towards supplies. And so there's two other times where it wasn't a delay, but it was actually uh, one time I had dropped a bottle of insulin that would have been plenty to get me through the travel and it broke and I lost all of that insulin. Um, and so I, after that, started to be a bit more prepared about knowing what the protocol is and how to get act, access to insulin. Um, so for example, in the United States, what you'd think would be the least amount of trouble is one of the highest uh, challenges because you have to go and see an actual doctor to get a prescription and pay for that doctor's experience and then go back to your pharmacy. And I tried to dialogue with the pharmacist, explain that I just dropped, I had the broken bottle and they would not sell me a bottle of insulin regardless. So it's good to know the, the policies there and just to be prepared for it. So if you recognize that you're running low uh, or if you find that you're gonna be staying longer, that you're ready to take action. Um, and the other part there is about the type of insulin. So in Thailand, for example, I went in just to see you know, how, how that experience was um, and getting insulin was very easy, but the type of insulin was very different. And I knew that because I had kind of done the research there, but I was curious about it. Um, and so the type of insulin is, is more of a, an older style, the Toronto uh, type of fast acting insulin, which is different than the Hemolog or Nova Rapid that we might see here every day. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, we have a, a question that's somewhat similar, and it's regarding supplies uh, with extended travel. And this person is wondering about shipping supplies to another country. They have been keen to go away for a month or two, but aren't clear on how to restock supplies and aren't sure if they could bring them all. Yeah, and I'm pro I won't have any advice for you as far as shipping goes because I've I've never had to do it, but I have you know, kind of come up with my own little tips and tricks so that I can fit a larger volume of supplies into 
less space. Um, um, so I, I use the, uh, the Libra scanner on my arm and they come in quite large boxes. Um, but if you take out the components that you need to insert it, it takes up half the space. Now you're supposed to use the same two pieces that come in the same box. So I use a Sharpie and I say, okay, I'm putting a one on the two that came to, on each of them that came together. And I'm bringing, put, putting twos on the other two that came together. And then I just put them in a Ziploc bag as opposed to bringing them in the boxes. Um, so that's, you know, it's sort of taking things out of the packaging. Um, test strips, um, instead of having 50 in a tube, I, I put 100 into the tube. So then, you know, just taking up that much less space, it, depending on how long you're traveling, if you are traveling for an extended period, I, you know, certainly you'll want to find a very reputable um, shipping service uh, to ensure you, you receive them. Yeah, and I have uh, seen some, so when I was going to university, uh, I was abroad, and I did have some care packages delivered to me. I think that's a fantastic way to go. Um, and the main thing is to know about how long you're in one spot. Because if you're on a rotating um, plan where maybe night to night you're moving from one place to another, that makes it a lot more challenging. And you're going to want to make sure that your supplies have reached a destination and that you've communicated to them that there will be an advanced package arriving so that you don't get there and feel any stress about when uh, that's going to arrive. Um, the one time that I had an insulin pump go down internationally um, was was pretty scary. It was actually just before the World Championships for me. So I was really worried about shipping uh, and how that was going to arrive. And I think it was five or six days before the World Championships started. Uh, and I was having a, you know, a bit of a meltdown and I went for a walk and kind of breathed it all out. Um, but it was really impressive to see that with less than 24 hours, I was able to get my new insulin pump arrive at the hotel that I was at. Um, so shipping can be a very effective way to get that. And that came from North America over to Europe. Um, so it was a considerable distance. Um, but, but it's important to know that like you have to follow those steps. And in my panic, you know, the last thing that I wanted to do was get on onto the phone and, and sit there, you know, and talk through with, with somebody. Um, but, but that was such a helpful um, uh, process to go through and the supports are there for us. So um, great idea to start self-supporting yourself. Um, and I, I think uh, Amanda's idea about uh, consolidating and, and organizing is, is a helpful step as well. Yeah, a couple of, couple of really actionable ideas there. And that there was another question that came in uh, regarding taking traveling overseas and taking freestyle uh, Libra sensors uh, that take up a lot of space. And I think that would apply, both those strategies would apply as well to that, that other question. Um, we have someone who asked, uh, said that their sugars usually go higher with anxiety and stress. And it's any ideas for packing insulin, pump equipment, et cetera. Um, wondering if sensors keep their accuracy while flying, wondering about pat down with masks on. Um, so I, I think there's, there's quite a number of questions kind of balled into, into the one recognizing this person also says they're, they're flying alone and, and it's going to be quite stressful. So I think, you know, we've, we've touched on some really great strategies for specifically packing uh, equipment and, and supplies. Uh, I suppose any, uh, any, any advice regarding accuracy of sensors while flying or uh, keeping masks on during uh, security pat down. Yeah, well, I would say um, to kind of touch on the, the first part regarding the anxious component is that I at some points would think, oh, do I really need to carry all this stuff? And uh, sometimes my travel is actually backpacking where you're carrying everything that you have with you, um, sometimes over 20 kilometers in a day. And luckily, I, I do a lot of traveling with other type ones. So I've seen them bring extra sensors. And for the while, like I would think, OK, if this sensor makes it, I'll be good for the whole the whole hike, but then it falls off, right? And then what do I do? I, I'm a, I'm a bit more anxious. I don't have the same type of support that I would want. So if you think about that risk versus reward, then even if you have to carry a little bit extra, or you have to be a little bit more creative on how you pack, uh, you know that you've got those backups. And so I've started to do that, and it actually hasn't made any impact on me um, in a negative way. I've just had to get a little bit more creative on how I pack. Um, and the same thing is going to you know translate into our approach to traveling and 
being ready, the more thought you put in advance, it should gain your confidence, right? And um, thinking about how we can manage. And sorry, Brooks, uh, if there's a, a little bit of a breakout on that, but I did want to comment on how how we can give ourselves confidence knowing that we have those backups. And um, and I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, absolutely, Chris, a, a fine answer. Amanda, could you maybe speak to uh, having traveled a bit yourself, you know, over the past, let's say over this summer, uh, your experience with keeping a mask on uh, during pat downs, or as, as it was mentioned earlier, not needing to go through a magnetic uh, pat down tube, or for lack of a better word, but going through uh, getting a manual pat down. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's been a while since I, um, I have had the manual pat down. Um, but one thing I'm actually when we were talking about the machine that sort of scans around you. Um, when I've gone through those with my pump, they actually do, um, then they take me aside and they, like, I remove my, I show them my pump in my hand and they kind of like do some kind of swab on, onto it or my hands. Um, but uh, as far as um, wearing the mask, um, it, it's sort of like when we're, you know, when we're at the grocery store that, um, you know, we are still, still wearing our, our mask, um, when they're looking at photos, they'll ask you to just move, you know, when they're checking your ID, like they'll ask you to lower your, um, your mask so they can make sure you're the same person on your passport. Um, but as far as wearing masks throughout the travel, I mean, let's face it, it's no fun, especially when you're wearing one for several hours, but not only us as, as uh, diabetics, but everyone around us is, is in the same boat. We just may have to take ours you know, down a few more times if we're if we're having to treat a low blood sugar. Thanks, Netta. Um, we have a, a question that is regarding a, an extra travel pump. Uh, so it's the question is thoughts on getting an extra travel pump. How can I get one? And I think I'll I'll add before before I hand the baton over to Chris and Amanda. Um, I think a, a recurring theme throughout this conversation is. Uh, when in doubt, having something on hand extra, even if it may be a bit of hassle to, you know, find an innovative way to pack that in, um, could be a really effective security measure, especially if you know that you're prone to some of that, uh, you know, travel scramble stress and anxiety. I'll just say that travel owners have been a part of the plan for a long time, and I think all the all the companies uh, provide those for you. So um, so the one thing that you want to make sure you're doing is planning ahead so that you've got time to go back and forth a little bit with an email to your to your pump choice that you have there. Um, and then that pump loaner should be coming to you for your for your travel, no matter what the company is that's available here in Canada. Um, I definitely think it's a good idea. And it's such a small, lightweight device to like tuck away inside of all the other pieces that you have. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I, I will say, make sure you either pre-program that loaner pump or have your pump settings recorded somewhere. Um, because it's great if you've got a loaner pump, but if you don't know how much insulin you're supposed to be getting at different times of day, um, then it, it's not going to be of great help to you. I also always have um, long-acting insulin with me. And uh, with a, you know, with my my medical team, you know, I know if I was without a pump, like sometimes I have gone on very last minute trips that I, you know, didn't have time to get a loaner. Um, so I at least know that if my pump decides to stop working, I know how much Levamir or Lantus to take uh, during that time. Yeah, that's a super helpful tip, Amanda. Having uh, something even on your phone if you have. Uh, I could keep a, a note. It's often they're, they're stored on a cloud, so you could access it from any device. Uh, just just take a quick log of before you take off on your trip, what your basal rate to what your bolus ratios are. It'd be a, a game changer if you find yourself in that position. Um, we have a, a one question. Other that, there, one other thought there is that sometimes people will use like an older pump that they have from a maybe even a different company. And so one thing that that's going to do is you're going to need to have like different supplies for each pump. So I think it's really worthwhile to ask for the loaner pump from like your most recent uh, choice 
so that you don't have to bring a whole bunch of, let's say, animus supplies. You've got an old animus kicking around, um, you know, and you've, you could access a loaner pump from, from your current co uh, company. Same thing with a blood test kit. If you bring a backup blood test kit, it's not that you really want to focus all your business on one product, but I mean, it makes it a lot more efficient um, for you to have the same strips as backups. Um, I have seen people on our trips that uh, will bring like one tube of, of backup supplies uh, with a backup meter that's different. And then if that one meter goes down, um, then they're, they only have 50 test strips for their backup, right? So that's not very many. So it's good to use the same brand, but I just thought might be a useful tip as well. Yeah, it's a good point. As, as someone who uh, quote unquote switched teams uh, to a new pump provider last year, you could definitely vouch for that of, you know, I, I do have some spare emergency supplies, but they wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't synergize with the system I use now. So when in doubt, keep it on, you know, simplify, use the same, same team. Um, we have someone who shared a story uh, a little bit, who said, on a positive note, uh, I went to Germany and forgot my extra insulin. I found out that in most countries in Europe, you can get insulin without a prescription. So that is helpful for anyone traveling to, uh, you know, the, the European Union or the EU 27. Uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty, pretty solid advantage, especially in considering, Chris, your story about uh, the, the hassle that you went through in, in the United States to get have to go through a doctor, get a full-on prescription, uh, and, and pay for that. So a bit of uh, a bit of solace to anyone who's who's Europe bound or wants to be Europe bound. That's um, right. You get to know in advance what you're going to deal with, and and that can be motivating. And at least you know, right? So that if something was to happen, you know what you have to go through, and it becomes less stress when you have that information for yourself. Yeah. yeah great. Great story there. Um, I have someone who is a, a relatively new type one diabetic. So first of all, thank you for for tuning in and. Uh, I hope you get, have the chance to, to get some travel relatively soon. Um, and then this person is asking, uh, they were advised that they require a medical note to show when they travel. Um, can we, can you advise from your experience sort of the, the process to go through for that and what it's like? So, so personally, I do have medical notes uh, from my endocrinologist. Um, and I think I even have one from my uh, family doctor. Um, I've been through, you know, hundreds of airports around the world. I've never had to show it. Um, however, I do have it in, you know, in my little travel medical bag uh, um, if I'm ever asked for it. But, um, but I've never actually had to provide it to anyone. Yeah. Um, and similarly, I've never had to provide it except for one time. And uh, this is actually um, for the most people are aware of the liquid ban. Um, and now that's been rescinded a little bit. But at one point when the liquid bomb first happened, it was in Heathrow Airport. And we had actually just flown through Heathrow to get to Italy. And then we were going back to Heathrow, which is in, um, it's in London. So uh, anyway, we were going back to that airport. And this was after the bomb scare had happened. So when going through the airport in Italy, they said absolutely no liquids. And I had my bottle of insulin um, and I was trying to explain to somebody and they, they were saying, no, no, no. And then I, I had my medical notes. So they ended up bringing it to another person. And that's why I said like, one of the things I've learned over time is to just keep your cool. Somebody will come along who will understand um, and try not to get escalated. Cause I thought, you know, I'm not gonna throw away my insulin here. This is, this is crazy, but um, they just needed to understand. So luckily I had that little form. And so that's the idea with the forms that when you do need it, at least you've got it. Um, it's going to be helpful for you. Hopefully you're like us with lots and lots of other travel experiences where you don't need to have anything like that. And, and thanks for that question. Cause it, it can be, especially as a, a first timer, it can be a bit confusing to know what, what pieces of paper do I actually need to prove this or to justify this? So um, better, better to have it than to not. Um, we have a question regarding uh, where to get COVID tests before flying. So uh, they say several types and, mo and the most convenient and reliable ones since they need to be done two days before flying. Um, so any recommendations on, on getting that done? I, I would, my inclination would be toward a, a, a self-directed test, but I'd be curious to hear your folks' thoughts. Yeah, so um, as far as that goes, it really depends where you're traveling to. Um, every, every country does have different requirements. Um, so th there are some countries that it could be 96 hours before you, you land. 
others three days before you depart, um, sometimes 48 hours. And, and I've helped clients um, with, you know, getting numerous tests. Um, for those of us, um, at least, and I can speak to Ontario, um, Shoppers Drug Mart and many other pharmacies do provide travel um, PCR testing. Um, so I would recommend that's probably the best way, way to go is to speak with your local pharmacy and, and see if they provide that, that is the current. And then of course, when you're, when you're in destination, and again, depending where you're traveling, um, in the U.S., sometimes you can have results within an hour. Um, you know, I know of clinics in Cairo, Egypt, that it's a drive-through testing facility and your results are in 12 hours. Um, so you'll really need to speak with somebody who either your travel, um, travel professional or, you know, someone in destination to let you know where to get it to return home to Canada. Um, but in Canada, I think your best bet is really going to be uh, uh, speaking with your local pharmacy and finding one that offers those services. And there is a cost. I think it's over $100. But no, if you're getting to explore the world, it's a small price to pay. Thanks, Amanda. And I, I think I'll add the, the caveat that it's, it's not necessarily uh, an expense, depending on province. So there, there are some provinces, for example, here in the Atlantic region where they, they are free. Um, but I would just look into that depending on, on where you live, what the, um, what the deal is with receiving a PCR test, uh, because it can, can vary. Um, I have a question that is specifically sort of around this idea of calming the nerves or, you know, self-directing uh, how, we, how we bring our own attitude into what can be a, a very stressful or overwhelming experience. And I have a viewer asking if you have any recommendations or ideas for uh, meditations that are easy to do and can help calm the nerves or if that's a practice that, that you folks use. I'll share, I'll share what uh, helped me. And so I mentioned a little bit about my height. Um, so I guess like when you first get into an uncomfortable position, you tend to complain about it, right? And then here I was on a national rowing team with everybody being, you know, six, three, six, four, six, six. And so everybody's starting to argue about who's going to get the best seat on the plane. And I just started to think about it myself, like, who do I want to be? And that's a you know a different way of, of meditating, but thinking about over and over again, like in this situation, what kind of person do I want to be? How do I want to contribute and how do I want to see this uh, go? And so I would often find myself just quickly, you know, taking the, uh, the window side seat um, or right in the middle of, of the, the row where there's three or four people um, and finding myself quite happy there. Whereas, you know, um, if, you, if you look to see how other people are responding, you might want to think, okay, I, I see that this person's upset. How can I respond differently? And so I just tried to get that into my mantra um, so that I was always trying to take the, the road that would, would lead me to be the type of person and the type of experience that I'd want to, to be experiencing myself. Um, and that, that really helped me with my, my travel experiences. And I remember quite a few experiences that were challenging, very constricted, um, but but working through those in, in peace with myself and the people around me. So I, I think that's a one strategy. Yeah, and, and I would add to that, and I'm a terrible person for last minute packing, leaving for the airport at the last minute, but those times where I am prepared and I'm packed a few days in advance or even the night before, and I'm leaving to get to the airport four hours before my flight. Um, I do find that, you know, not being stressed about the traffic I'm sitting in or throwing things into, into my backpack um, minutes before I'm leaving, that really does help with my overall peace of mind, as well as my blood sugars. I, I generally, when I have been prepared in advance and early to the airport, I don't see the same spikes as when I'm racing through the terminal to get to the gate. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Um, so I think seeing no more questions, uh, I want to say thanks to everyone who, who did submit the question. I really appreciate a lot of the, the, the angles from which you're approaching this. So, and I also get the sense that it's as much as it can be a, a challenging one to prepare for, travel is 
by definition, such an exciting, uh, you know, full of potential energy. So I can tell there's a lot of, you know, excitement behind the stress almost. And I hope that this has helped to, to clear up a bit of that, that uncertainty or anxiety. Um, before, before we wrap up, I'd like to just take a moment to tell you, tell you folks about how Diabetes Canada is helping support you as we prepare for a return to travel or more frequent travel. So you can visit our website and our social media to stay up to date on what we're working on and, and resources that we're, we're, we put out. Uh, and for specific direction on this, if you have any specific tips or, or a question that, that you didn't, uh, didn't get answered today, uh, you can call our helpline at 1-800-BANTING or you can email info at diabetes.ca for any questions. Uh, you can also specifically on this topic, check out, as mentioned, diabetes.ca slash air travel. Uh, and that'll have all the resources we have around this, this topic including uh, you know, how to access resources like, uh, like a medical note, uh, packing lists, and more. So I want to give a, a huge heartfelt thank you to our guests, uh, Amanda Gill and Chris Jarvis, for a really fantastic conversation. Thank you for, for making the time and, and sharing some of your, your expert knowledge on this front. Um, before we wrap up, any final remarks to our viewers? Uh, well, I would love to share, you know, on that note of the excitement part, uh, definitely the eating is one of the things that's caught me off guard on travel. Um, so uh, I remember in Brazil, there was a restaurant that we went to that was all meat, just circulating platters of meat. And, um, and so it was a delicious night. But I didn't realize that if you eat a large portion of, of fats and proteins, that it can also affect your blood sugar. And so I had a really rough night after that. And so sometimes, you know, using those moments of reflection to realize that you're learning. Um, so that was a night where I probably ate more meat than I'd ever eaten before in my life. But I didn't have a lot of carbohydrates. And so the, uh, the blood sugar didn't start spiking until about three or four hours later. Um, but I just like, you know, just welcome you all to think about that wonderful experience. I, I will never forget that restaurant. And uh, the night afterwards, you know, that that's not a big part of it, right? So we, we might suffer a little bit along the way as we explore and open up new horizons, but we're also learning. And I know better to how to manage that for next time. So I encourage you that as you go and explore your, your new horizons to, uh, to keep coming back to these resources and reaching out for support as we learn together. Yeah, and, I, and on that note, you know, it's okay to not be perfect all the time. And, and it can be especially hard to stay under control when you're in a new environment and eating new food. So don't beat yourself up, just correct and enjoy the rest of your day um, because it's all new for all of us when we, when we go new places. So do your best to enjoy and not beat yourself up if you do have a spike or a low. Thanks so much, folks. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll wrap up. And I just sincerely hope that uh, this webinar has been helpful for, for you, all of our viewers. I know I was super appreciative of this conversation uh, as I'm gearing up for some travel myself. It's really, really wonderful to start thinking about this stuff. And on that wonderful point of, you know, it, it can be a really difficult hand to, to travel with diabetes, but that, that doesn't mean you can't pursue all the wonderful learning and, and experiences along the way. It's just one one extra hurdle that's that's on the path to a great experience. Um, so please feel free to contact us at Diabetes Canada for any any info or for any questions. Uh, and thank you all and take care. Happy travels. <laughs>